that. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham with me, JJ and this Yobi. You're with Talk on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Coming up, in Scotland, new hate crime laws come into effect today despite widespread condemnation as critics say they could have a chilling effect on freedom of speech. It's total Tory wipeout as a new poll reveals the Conservatives are on course for their worst ever general election results. And the King has returned with an Easter walkabout telling well-wishers that he's doing his best. Good evening, Britain, and welcome to the Independent Republic of JJ and Nisyobi. Mr. Graham is still away this week, so my reign as acting dictator continues, and I've got a blockbuster of a show for you. First up, the ginger Winger and his wife have been named the joke of Hollywood. We'll discuss Prince Harry and Meghan Markle with Kinsey Schofield. Plus, find out why Rishi Sunak is in the doghouse with his own party over a new crime bill. And the Queen of Darkness, Mrs. Sharon Osbourne, will be live here later in the show. This is the Independent Republic. Let's get it on. A controversial new law to tackle hate crime comes into effect in Scotland today, the Hate Crime and Public Order Act. The bill piggybacks off of existing legislation on the offence of stirring up racial hatred, extending it to the protected characteristics of disability, religion, sexual orientation, age and transgender identity. And for anyone found to be committing a crime motivated by hatred towards those characteristics, a harsher sentence will be given too. I'm joined now by former political editor of The Sun, Trevor Kavanagh. Trevor, good evening, mate. Uh, does this bill stifle freedom of speech? I think it might, uh, JJ. <laughs> um, it's not as if <clears throat> the police have got nothing else to do, is it? Although they've abdicated recently any uh, intention of uh, following up any minor crimes, as they call it, like burglary and other things, which really annoy people. And so they've got uh, an extra 500 cops, don't know where they come from, to look into hate crime, which is a horrible expression in itself and uh, should be banned as a, an expression of hatred all by itself. And so anybody, including wives, children, family, visitors around the dinner table, will be able to anonymously uh, accuse innocent people in some cases, some people will be guilty, but mostly people will be simply making inadvertent remarks which are going to be reported to specially designated centres, uh, about 400 of them dotted around Scotland, including a sex shop uh, for some reason, um, where they can claim that someone's uh, uttered words which are forms of hatred against anyone of several uh, different forms like uh, race, uh, gender, um, uh, probably obesity, anything you like that you feel that you've been offended by. And then the police have to and have promised they will investigate. They will drop all other investigations and look into your potentially entirely petulant grievance. That seems crazy. So the bill's going to allow people to be called out for what they could say even in their own homes. So if I'm sat at home and I say... That Mike Graham is a bit of a fatty, isn't he? He could lose some weight. Someone in my house could call up the police if we were in Scotland and report me for that. Yes, indeed. And uh, as I say, the police have promised to investigate every single allegation. I'm delighted to hear that one of the prime targets, not because I want her to be, uh, is J.K. Rowling, the Harry Potter genius. And uh, she has vowed that she will fight any attempt to prosecute her. Now, she could become the very first test case to this stupid law. And with her resources and her access to the finest legal brains in the world, if not Scotland, um, will be able to contest and I think defeat any attempt to prosecute her. It seems that 
every kind of possible characteristic is being protected. However, being a woman is not protected by this law. No, and this is the whole point about the trans issue. The idea that all anyone who wants to be uh, defined as a woman can do so and therefore enter women's uh, only spaces or uh, compete in women's only sport um, are, are made to be as ludicrous as they are. So uh, they can be uh, regarded... I, what, where do we start with the case of the, uh, the rapist um, that... Uh, claimed to be a woman and has had repeated um, uh, rape I, charges proved Isla against Bryson. Him. Isla Bryson, you mean? So Isla Bryson. Yeah. Isla Bryson and even Yousef Humad, uh, the, uh, the, the leader of the uh, uh, SNP in Scotland, is up for um, hate crimes against her by saying that she wasn't a proper, proper, proper woman. So, you know, this is the whole point about this law is that it's almost incomprehensible to the point where the police cannot police it. So will they just apply some common sense here? Because as we're talking about Isla Bryson or Adam Graham, as I prefer to call him or her, Isla Bryson, double rapist, turned up to court in, I remember the picture, a very, pair, very tight pair of purple leggings. You could see her penis. So surely if, if, I, went, if I was in Scotland and I said, no, no, that, that's, that's not a woman, that is a man. And then somebody tells the police, JJ just uh, misgendered that, that woman who's, who's a double rapist. Surely the police would, would look at that case and, and say, actually, and, the, and on this occasion, JJ is, uh, there's no charges to press against him. Well, I would hope so, JJ, but the thing is that you've actually just hit on a very important issue here. Um, this alleged woman has a penis, and uh, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, suggests that tens of thousands of people who are men but proclaim to be women have penises. So is this going to remain in Scotland? Is this absurd law going to be limited just to the Scottish uh, frontier? Or is it going to spread south into Britain generally? I mean, we've seen Labour in action uh, on the um, question of uh, woke agendas on bending the knee to uh, Black Lives Matters, uh, insisting that some women uh, have penises. Why won't they pick up the same sort of hate law which is applying in Scotland. And it's extremely alarming that this sort of culture war is spreading across the country to the deteriorate detriment of everybody in the country. Right, well, stay on the line, Trevor. Let's turn now to plans to effectively criminalise rough sleeping because ministers are facing revolt from their own MPs over the government's flagship crime bill that would give police in England and Wales powers to fine or move on rough sleepers deemed to be causing a quote-unquote nuisance. Joining me now is former Met Police detective Mike Neville. Good evening, Mike. Uh, how can you police homeless people over sleeping rough? Well, it's uh, very difficult, JJ. And you'd think that uh, the government re realised the police have enough to do. You know, there's 1% uh, of thefts get solved and 5% of burglaries are solved. So the police are obviously uh, got other things uh, to deal with. And you would hope if they were going to introduce this legislation that they would produce viable alternatives to people who do sleep on the street who are maybe forced to do so. Uh, and so the, what we've got to give these uh, people is that there's no excuse for being on the streets. But I fear uh, that the legislation will be introduced and expect, expect the, people, the police to do something about it. Uh, and these alternative venues will not be introduced. Uh, and, the, and then what will happen is that we'll just carry on as normal because the police, uh, as I say, have got more things to do. Yeah, well, Trevor, creating new laws to criminalise the homeless, that doesn't stop people from being homeless. They're talking about giving fines up to £2,500. How do you get £2,500 from somebody who has no abode and presumably has not got two and a half grand in their pocket? Well, as we've just heard, this is a very difficult and sensitive and delicate issue to deal with, but it needs to be dealt with because we are turning into the equivalent of the San Francisco um, homeless tent cities. Um, and in parts of London, if you walk up the Strand on a, um, say, nine o'clock on a, a weekday morning, you'll find people sleeping in various forms of accommodation in the shop windows of uh, shop uh, fronts of um, uh, 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 shops all the way down the street. Um, it, it has to be dealt with in a way which works. And the trouble is that uh, just as with immigration, as soon as you identify a move to deal with it, 
uh, you arouse a hornet's nest of uh, protest from those who think that it's an evil thing to, to try and um, criminalize innocent people who are going about their business, but they are not going about their business. You've got to remember that there are a million job vacancies. None of these people are employed, as far as we know. There are plenty of jobs around for them to work for and earn a living and maybe put a roof over their heads. So the whole welfare system aggravates the problem of homelessness, plus the attitude towards families and marriage and divorce, so that uh, people, young people in particular, find themselves almost booted out of the homes that they've lived in, and they have very little other alternative. So look, it is a complicated uh, problem, but it needs tough action. Mike, we're seeing the number of armed forces veterans who are homeless increasing each and every year. It's just going up and up and up. But I don't want to see people who've put their life on the line for our country, people who've served our country bravely, now being described as a nuisance. And, and what constitutes even being a nuisance? Simply sleeping, sleeping rough in a doorway, suddenly you're a nuisance? I'm an ex, uh, I'm a veteran, uh, I was a soldier, and uh, what I would caution about this, there are some veterans on the streets, but there are also people who claim to be veterans, and the first question I always ask is, what was your, what was your army number before I give them any money? Uh, but I'll, obviously, if somebody has has been a veteran, is so suffering, often suffering from mental health issues and the like, they deserve the best uh, form uh, of help. And I just hope with this, there is a, there is some form of plan that, that not only do the uh, councils and the sort of government bodies provide something, but there is coordination with service charities uh, and with uh, the Salvation Army and uh, other other uh, voluntary bodies who can actually provide these uh, alternative places. So there is no excuse because Trevor is actually you know correct about the issues in uh, California. We really don't want that uh, replicated uh, in London. And you ask me what the, the nuisance could be anything, couldn't it? Being too smelly, blocking the door. What else could it be? Mm. It seems very um, uh, wide uh, wide, and, and, and very easy to, to, to misuse. But I, I really do say that the police won't, won't be able to enforce it because they simply haven't got enough officers. I completely agree with you. But what powers do the police already have for moving the homeless on? Well, they, they use the uh, the Vagrancy Act, which was brought in in 1824, you know, 200 years ago, to deal with the veterans of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, tragically. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the police already have uh, some powers to deal with people and to arrest them if need be. But it, it's it's not, you're never going to arrest yourself out of homelessness. There's far better solutions as... You know, Trevor highlighted the fact that there is uh, unemployment uh, and, and plenty of jobs uh, going begging. So there needs to be a better coordinated effort rather than the police grabbing older people and putting them in the cells. Yeah, Trevor, I don't think the public are going are gonna to like this law. I don't think we'll be sympathetic towards it. I think Britain, at its heart, is a giving country. We are very charitable. I think people are going to look at our, our government, our multi-millionaire uh, prime minister and say, you're punishing people who are already at the bottom of society. Why would you introduce a law that is hurting those who are already uh, helpless? Well, I don't think, first of all, that you can blame our multi-millionaire prime minister for this. This has been going on for a long time. It's been uh, growing and it's been imported from America and it's going to get worse as the fentanyl drug problem sweeps across the Atlantic and we find people not just sleeping in doorways, but stumbling around like zombies. Um, where do you start? I mean, the welfare system is busted. And we've got no money to build new houses or any uh, approvals for them to be built. And people simply do not want people sleeping in their doorways. I mean, why do they need to sleep in the Strand and in Bond Street and Mayfair? Uh, they are there in order to attract attention and act in uh, as beggars Many of them, I mean, look, some of them, as Mike pointed out earlier, quite rightly, deserve all the help and support they get. But many of them are professional beggars and they make quite a lot of money that uh, they then tuck away or go elsewhere. I mean, I was, I was in, no, I won't go into the anecdote, it's too complicated, <laughs> but I can tell you that there are people out there who are masquerading as homeless when they've got homes but they walk around with shopping trolleys full of their worldly goods and they could easily, and they already do from begging, make a living, they could make one legitimately. 
Well, look, our future king, Prince William, is making it his mission to end homelessness. I think I'd rather support that more holistic way of getting people off the streets rather than saying we're going to find them, we're going to throw them in prison, perhaps. But Trevor and Mike, thank you both for your time. You are watching The Independent Republic of JJ. It's total Tory wipeout. A new poll revealed Conservatives are on course for their worst ever general election results. Don't go anywhere. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat, oi. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read a statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have moved on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of JJ and this Yobi on Talk TV. Now, the Tories have approached their lowest point yet. A new large sample poll states they are heading for less than 100 seats at the general election, with senior ministers and even the Prime Minister himself at risk of losing his seats. Joining me to discuss this is my new cabinet, author, activist and commentator Keith Fraser, Talk TV contributor Esther Kraku and lawyer Andrew Eborn. <laughs> Good evening, cabinets. Good evening. Welcome. How are you doing? Welcome. So, the, the Tories, less than 100 seats? This is going to be complete obliteration. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? And <laughs> so, so, Salvation, who are talking about the starvation of the Tories, they're predicting that what have they got? Uh, just sort of uh, 98. Uh, 98 seats to Labour's 468. Mm -hmm. um, that's the sort of reality. Uh, and I think, uh, but an earth is an earth. Talking about Easter. Easter an earth is an earth. Uh, Very an good. Earth, Easter Monday. But the reality <laughs> is this, is that Rishi has to deliver on the f those five promises. Uh, and he hasn't yet called the election. He doesn't have to until the end of January. That's the very last date he can do it. And that, according to the things, that those are the rules. 
rules. I think he can, it has to be December. Oh, no, election. he can call it in December. We then get the period election. of time. Yeah. So the period of time when the election voting will take place in January. The end of January. Yes. So he's got time to do it. And my advice to him would be wait until things improve. So he needs to see some sort of progress <laughs> in Rwanda. <laughs> Wait till things improve. I guarantee the gap will close. The gap will close between them at the moment. Oh, as it true. always does. You must remember, you must remember this. I always say Trump and Clinton. Uh -huh. And everybody laughed at Trump, didn't they? And I was probably one of the very few people who ever predicted that Trump was going to do it. And everybody woke up, they went to bed thinking Hillary's going to win it. So we're all going to bed, we're going to sleep at night. And in the morning, there's Donald. So what's your prediction for this one? My then? prediction, oh, soon that's going to win massively. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, absolutely. <laughs> Look, I, I think on the Conservatives have a big problem because, and I've said this, they seem as detached from reality as the rest, the rest of, of the entire cohort in Westminster. Ian Duncan Smith came out and said that we shouldn't vote for, the public shouldn't vote for reform because that's going to reverse pr Brexit progress and it's going to usher in a giant Labour majority. And this, these kinds of statements, these kind of reform, uh, scaremonger fear-mongering are rooted in arrogance because he's not making a sales pitch for the Tories. The Tories are not saying... Here, here are reasons why you should vote for us. Here, here is our vision for the country. And I keep going on about vision, but it matters. Here, are, here is our vision for the country. And why is it better than Labour's vision for the country or reform or Lib Dem? They're not actually trying to sell why they should be voted in by, by the public. Yeah, they, they are. They don't. Stick to the plan. Stick to the plan. That's what you keep saying. What, Stick yeah. to the, the plan. Thing is, but what are we getting out of it at the end of the day? What are we? What is the? How is the British public going to be better off by this five-point plan that he's laid out like he's a school teacher, but it's not actually saying at the end of the day you will feel better because you have a more cohesive communities. Uh, healthcare will be better funded. Infrastructure will be improved. He's not saying any of that. He's just saying this is the plan, and whatever happens. But it's, it's going to be better. I've got to tell you. I've got to tell you. If this is true, and it turns out to be ninety-eight seats. God help this country, because let's face it, Labour always ruin it in, in the end <gasps> anyway. Look, I'm not, I, I am not a Conservative voter, like, 100%. Okay. But, but I you like Rishi Sunak. This is a man who could, be, who could be lying on a beach in the Caribbean if he wanted to. I, I, he I agree. dedicated his life and given back to this country. He's doing a good job, he's a steady pair of hands, and he took over this country when, let's face it, we were in rough waters. Inflation is down. He is the man to the job. He's just been very unlucky because came before him, you had, you know, Liz Truss, with all due respect, way no, out of that there. Boris Johnson, whose moral <laughs> compass was... Well, he hasn't got a moral compass. <laughs> and, 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 and Rishi has un, been unfortunate as he had to follow two disasters. But, but you, say, you, say, you say that about Boris. Uh, to his credit, it was an 80-seat majority. He was the only politician at the time. He was, they sort of called him the Heineken of politicians. He could reach the parts of the electorate, others couldn't. He's mm -hmm. now become the Marmite character. Mm -hmm. What we need are characters in politics, which is why I say don't write it off completely, because the reality is there will be delivery on those sort of things. But you're right, Esther, you need to tell people how they're going to benefit. And the way that you're going to do it is what Edward Bernays, who was the father of PR, said. The way that you convince the public is through fear. So if you say we're making progress, well, mm. or no, you may, we're making progress in these areas, and if you change ships at this moment or change the captain for the ship, you're not going to carry on this great progress because there's no plan for Labour, he'll continue to say. Keep sending that message, and I guarantee the gap will close. Well, talking of ships... <laughs> the, Is that ship? Talking of ships, <laughs> oh, ships. with a P. Ships with a P, yeah, 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 with yes. ships. <laughs> the, the, the migrant migrant ships, they, they're still oh. coming. Yeah, We've uh, now passed the 5,000 mark. Yes. A new record. So yeah. soon, actually, can we please about that, the right? Boat. He hasn't stopped the boat. I, I, I think I, I predict they will get maybe three flights off to Rwanda with all five go. people on them. So that'll be another uh, shambolic display. Look, if we're going to... OK, let me, let me be gracious and say he has to stick to the plan and if it works. Uh, he hasn't done anything to bring down inflation. Inflation was always going to come it's down. Going to come so that, that, exactly, right. exactly. So that's always been a bit of a red herring. He hasn't stopped the boats. If anything, he's I think he's probably rolled out the red carpet for them because they're still coming. Uh, what else did he say? Fund the NHS. Well, uh, this week... Cut the waiting was, times. Cut the waiting this. times. Exactly. This week it was found that over 230 people yeah, needlessly died because of a and &E waiting time. Awful. So he hasn't Absolutely approved awful. it. And even actually, that li the list, even if we're going to give him credit, is bogus because he should have said transform the NHS or provide better health care to the public. But back, don't, to, don't my, but back, to, back to migration because that's, that's the record that is yes. now, well, exactly. now, now proudly got. Keith, is there anything Sudak can do about migration that's going to change, change the, 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 Look, the way we're, people, the voters are going to... Of course, Keir Starmer's going to say that this whole Rwanda policy is a bit of a gimmick. But in actual fact, it's interesting that, they, that they're saying if you come over, you get, you're going to be on a plane to Rwanda. Rwanda? 
is doing enormous amounts of advertising at the moment to go and visit. It's not yeah. this is I, not the hellhole that people think anymore. It, they sponsor my football team, Arsenal. Yes. Well, that's and that can't be bad. There, there you go. No wonder it's a dangerous exactly. country. <laughs> 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 well, They've well, got look, no the, taste. The reality, yeah. <laughs> the reality is this, though. <laughs> Nobody wants to send anybody to Iran. The whole idea, and this is what we're talking about the focus, the focus should be on the uh, horrendous people traffickers. 100%. That's the thing. What we need to do is spend the money on tracking them down and dealing with that appropriately. The whole principle, if you're, the, the thing about small boats is crazy anyway, because the thing, you stop the boats or lose the votes. What's going to happen? Rwanda at the moment can only deal with 200 people. Mm -hmm. The amount of people coming in and out, there's legal migration as well. There's over a million people are coming in on student issue? visas and so on and so forth. So we're missing the issue on that. What we need to do is, and what I love about this sort of show, especially when JJ does it with the crew, <laughs> is that we always shine more light and less heat. If you look at the real figures, they're over a million in terms of immigration. Uh -huh. These small boats are a distraction. I know people involved who are stopping a number of people from coming over. There's tens of thousands more who are trying to do it and mm -hmm. are getting stopped. So that's happening. But we're going to the boats are an issue. They, they, and they are an need issue. to be done. And it's a public issue. But we're, we're going to see more boats coming this summer. We will. When, do. when it gets hotter, when the weather's better. Exactly. More than so 5,000 already people are coming. Since, yeah. You know, so. so do you think that Sunak should call an election before summer? Ab never. Absolutely not. He should call an election after the American election. I've always said this. Yep. I think if you... If when you, Donald you, Trump you, wins, You've, yes. ta you've, you've <laughs> yeah. talked about fear. And, yes. I, and I don't think... I'm sorry, the Tories have done such a disastrous job that nothing that they do can put fear in the public because their track record has been scary enough. But they can say, look, a Rishi Sunak premiership looks a lot better if Trump wins the White House it again does. than a, a Keir Starmer premiership. And that is something I can actually buy into. Because I think we, don't, that, we, don't, we don't have a plethora... Where's, where's Esther, the Brexit Esther, free trade deals? Esther, Esther, Where you, are they? Esther, Esther, you're into politics. You think John in Doncaster gives the monkeys who gets into power in the US? Of course they, he does. No, they don't. It's the largest no, they don't. economy oh, Johnny, in the world. Johnny, I was on the vote with Johnny Doncaster <laughs> earlier today. <laughs> and he tells me he cares about what, what Donald Trump's going to do. But you're absolutely right. Absolutely. Look at that sort of side. What we also need to look at are those other sort of elements. There will be that feel-good factor. And when I talk about fear, I'm talking about fear of the alternatives. Because at the moment, I've yet, at the moment, people are just voting negatively. There They're not turning around. They're not turning around and saying, oh, we're really for Keir Starmer, oh, we're really for Rishi. It's yeah. a negative vote. They haven't got confidence. And I always say trust comes in on foot but leaves on horseback. And trust in politicians, in our media, in our various services, is at an all-time low. What we need to do over the next few months is build that trust back up again. But here's another thing. You know, you may, you may have it right, Esther, because if we do wait until after the US election, the one thing that is very important is the Anglo-American relations. Exactly. It is important. Absolutely. And I cannot it's see most our relations with Keir Starmer as leader being, to be honest with you, very reliable, if, uh, as opposed to Rishi Sunak, who I think will continue things and keep things on a on a good footing. I, th I, think, I think you're all wrong. I think most people, and Jonathan Goodis MP told me the same thing about his constituency in the north, in Stoke-on-Trent. Most people actually aren't that bothered about immigration as, as the top priority. They're bothered about potholes in our roads. Yes. You can't drive... That's a local, local, local election. Yeah, local election. Yeah. Um, they're bothered about the NHS. Mm -hmm. They're bothered about local jobs. Yes. And they're bothered about transport. But self inherently, self, but, yeah, but self that, 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 that means they're worried about immigration because guess what? Unfettered immigration affects the NHS. Yes. It affects local housing. It affects councils. It affects all of these things that you just listed are people's top priorities. And, so and, inherently, they and, do care. And you're absolutely and, right. And we need a certain amount of immigration to make the wheels uh, turn. We need certain people working in the care homes and jobs that people don't want to do. To be perfectly honest, we need an immigration freeze, actually. The numbers that we're seeing now are so staggering that for the next five years, we need an actual freeze and say, let's bring it to 350,000. Let's have a certain number for certain industries. And over that, I'm sorry, you need to deal with what you have. And invest in the British okay, public. Okay, uh, listen, And listen, AI listen. is the other thing. The, the three of you put a sock in it, okay? <laughs> we'll hear more from you a little later in the show, but thank you for now. <laughs> <laughs> you are watching The Independent Republic of JJ. Up next, the Queen of Darkness, Sharon Osbourne, on her family, the Royals, and rock and roll. Sharon, I cannot wait to speak to you. Don't go anywhere. You won't want to miss it. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of JJ and this Yobi. Now, she is one of the most powerful women in the music and television world. She's the other half of the Prince of Darkness. She was the OG of reality TV. And most importantly, she's my work wife. Making her debut appearance on the Independent Republic of JJ, let me welcome the one and only Sharon Osborne. Sharon, hello. DJ, I miss you. Yeah, return my phone calls then, eh? <laughs> <laughs> After the show, definitely. Right. First off, how are you and how is Ozzy? I'm doing really well, thank you. Um, sorry I didn't get to see you when I was in London, but yeah. I'm doing good. <laughs> I'm busy packing up this bloody old house of ours and getting out of here. So you're actually going to come back? Because for the last three years, you've been saying to me, we're moving back, we're moving back. Is it actually going to happen oh. now? Yeah, it is. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> right, let's get on to something I know you love talking about. Meghan Markle. <laughs> Has, oh, a, yeah. Has America come to the point where they are just sick of the Sussexes now? Um... And listen, I think so. I think that, you know, they've tried so many different things, you know, a production deal, um, their podcast, now they're flogging household stuff. I mean, what else are they going to do? They've <laughs> tried a bit of everything and nothing's worked so far. Well, the, the, the Netflix documentary that they, they did, that was the most successful documentary ever on Netflix. That worked. Well, that worked because who doesn't want to watch a, a spare, as he calls himself, <laughs> and his missus? I mean, it's interesting TV to see uh, another side of them. Yeah. Um, well, there's one poll in the US at the moment that says most Americans want to see Harry deported, especially if it comes out that he lied on his immigration form and said that he'd never taken drugs before. You know what? Do you know how many people lie about that and they get in here? I mean, I think that's ridiculous. Oh, really? So, wait, so you're defending Harry. You're, you're going to say, if he did lie, it's all right. Everyone breaks the law in America. 
That's right. I mean, come on. How many people lie about they took drugs or they didn't take drugs? It, you know, that's it. It's the world we live in. Well, I haven't lied. I've been to America loads. I don't lie about taking drugs. I haven't taken drugs, by the way, but I never lied about it. But listen, what's the biggie? He's not a, he's not a, a practising uh, addict, is he? <laughs> Maybe not. I just feel that there is some special treatment around Harry. If this was someone from, say, south of the border who'd come in and, they, and he wasn't the, king of, uh, wasn't the son of the king and it turns out he'd lied on his papers, would the US be saying, right, you've got to go back, back to your own country? Uh, yeah, they would. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a double standard then. Fine, fine. Yeah, now, another question about Meghan. If she is as unpopular as, as we think she is now in the US, is she going to make any money from this um, American Riviera orchard selling pillowcases and knives and forks and tea sets or whatever? I think it depends. Everything depends on what she's flogging. If it's, if it's good quality and it's at a reasonable price, why not? It could work. Hmm. Um, well, speaking of, again, uh, Harry and Meghan, what advice would you give them now? Because it seems like they're kind of at a crossroads. They've burnt their bridges with people here in the UK. The US have kind of fallen out of love with them. What would you advise them as, as a PR maestro? What, 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 what can they do now to try and revive their, their careers, I guess? I think they've got to stop making themselves so accessible it's like you know they turn up at the opening of an envelope and i think that they've got to really pull back and you know less is more and i don't think they've heard that mm, okay well listen you're coming back in the coming months to the uk i've got a warning for you sharon stay out of scotland okay do not go oh there oh my lord <laughs> what is going on over there yeah so this new law means that anything that you say, even to me in private, if we're, we're up there in Scotland and we, and we say something behind closed doors or via WhatsApp and someone grasses on us to the, to the police, you could get arrested and charged with a hate crime now. It's, I mean, it's at a ridiculously stupid level. I mean, that is just ridiculous. It is. Well, there's, there's some, some more, more trans, trans news for you as well here. Um, I don't know if you've heard about this story. Down in Australia... A women's soccer team, so it's a football team that is purely for women, and they play in a league that is purely for women. But one of these teams had five players who were trans. So people who were born male, but, but now playing for a women's football team. Not surprisingly, this football team ended up smashing it. They beat one team 10-0. They, they didn't lose a single game. And apparently, some of the girls who were complaining about playing against men were told, if you complain, that could also be a hate crime. That could be discrimination. The world is going mad. Oh, everybody's lost the plot. I mean, it's insanity. And the thing is, it's not people's, you know, opinion. It's scientific proof that medical science that men are stronger than women. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you may be trans, but it doesn't alter your, um, your body. You can have your old boobies cut off and a little fiddly diddly down there, but it still means that um, medically you are, you're a man and yeah. they're stronger. And um, the thing is, if the football team all agree with it, then okay, they agree with it. It's not for us to comment, but I, I think it's all crazy. I do nothing against trans, nothing against them at all, but, it's like if you look at what happened with the um, with the swimmers that were trans, they you know they were just beating everybody. And and when this person was a man, I think he was like a hundred and thirtieth in the ratings, yeah. and now he's you know winning everything. Well, yeah. she is winning everything. I should say. I don't want to get arrested in Scotland for saying. <laughs> right. Let's touch on um, some more on the royals now. Uh, I can't stand him, but the Duke of York, he was out and about on Sunday uh, accompanying his brother Charles. I really think that he should just disappear and not be seen again. But for some reason, Prince Andrew, he's walking around like he's got no cares in the world. He's, everything's forgiven. He's one, one of the people again. He's part of, part of the firm. What do you think we should do with him? 
I think, again, a, a less is more. I think that he should really go into retirement. And, you know, he's just, I don't have much respect for him or any respect for him whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Well, the people of York think he should have his um, title stripped of him. He's lost everything. He's lost all his charity work. He's lost his army titles and everything. Yeah, everything. So, um, Duke of York I mean, should go to? It's, but the thing is, does it mean anything when you're the Duke of York or Sussex? I mean, they're so tiny, these little places. I mean, it's like, what does it mean in the big picture of life? Nothing. Yeah. Well, look, Sharon, I'm the Duke of Dudley and you're the Duchess of, uh, of Birmingham by default, by marriage. Yeah. Of course it means something. Of course it bloody does. You know, he's just he's just a bit of a pillock, you know, so you just you just have to ignore him, hope he goes away. Yeah, well, speaking of pillocks, Joe Biden. Uh, yeah. Listen, I think Trump's going to do it. I think Trump's going to get re-elected. I think Biden is looking shaky at the best of times, but he's in hot water again because he repurposed Easter Sunday as Transgender Recognition Day. He didn't mention Easter Sunday. He didn't mention the resurrection of Jesus. Now, from my point of view, I thought America was this God-fearing country and that would have been what he was trying to... He, sh he should have been going all out to, to win over the, the Bible Belt instead of talking about the Transgender Recognition Day. I don't even know what that really is. I think it's just another desperate move to, um, to go to the minorities, to try and, you know, be every, everything to everyone. And it's a desperate attempt to to reach out to trans people to say, look, I'm not against you. I love you. You can have your own day. What about old white women day? When are we going to get it? <laughs> you're not old. You're just a white woman. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> <laughs> now, last question, Sharon. Um, you told me a little while ago uh, that you were going to plan a, a farewell concert for Ozzy. Is that still going to go ahead? Yeah. Yes, it is. It's going ahead at Aston Villa next summer. Oh, so it's confirmed. You're definitely going to do it at Aston yeah. Villa, at the yeah. Villa Ground in Birmingham. Yeah, and you better be there. Well, if you actually answer my phone calls this time, then yeah, I'll be there. All right, I will. <laughs> and when you come back, don't forget, we've got that podcast to sort out as well. We are. We're going to do it together. We are, we are. Right, Sharon, thank you so much. Love you. Love you, JJ, very much. Miss uh, you. You too, you too. Thank All you. Right. Yeah. Bye. You're watch Bye, love. <laughs> You're watching The Independent Republic of JJ. Coming up, the king is reportedly in high spirits as he's been spotted out and about over the Easter weekend. But find out which royal stole the show. I think you can guess. Back in three. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! <laughs> it's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, <we're> missing. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put the statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of JJ, here live on Talk TV. And now it's time for Taking the Mic. Now, when I heard about this story, genuinely I presumed it was just an April Fool's joke. Sadly, it ain't. A women's football competition has been branded misogynistic after it was won by a team featuring five transgender players. So let me make this clear and give you some context because context is everything. This is a women's only football competition in Australia, which is supposed to encourage women to play football in a safe and inclusive space. And yet one team, the team which won the tournament and $1,000 in prize money, featured five players who were born male. So the Flying Bats, yes, that is the name of the team, the Flying Bats, they and their five male players won every game, including a 10-0 victory in which one of their trans players scored six goals. Now. Since the winning team hit the headlines, it's emerged that organisers had earlier held a crisis meeting during which rival teams were warned. If they forfeited games against the Flying Bats, it would be viewed as an act of discrimination. So my question is, do people not care about the safety of women anymore? Is that, what, is that where we are? Men are stronger and faster. We're heavier than females. That's just biology. When women-only teams have played against men, they have been humiliated. The US women's soccer team got spanked just last year, 12-0, by a bunch of retired players from Wrexham. Uh, the US national women's team is widely considered to be the best female team in the world. And they also previously lost to 14-year-old boys. It is not fair for men to compete against women in sports because we have that natural God-given advantage with our muscle mass and our bigger frames. We, men, will cause injuries to women if we play against them. And so if females don't want to compete against us, they shouldn't have to. That's why our sports are separated by sex. But they certainly shouldn't be threatened for forfeiting a game that puts them in any kind of danger. The funny thing about all of this is that it's women who are most likely to stand up now and scream, bigot, JJ, you're a bigot for what you're saying. It seems that protecting female sport is now less important to some than allowing men to dominate a space where they do not even belong. So stop taking the mic, start protecting our women. Now, it was a welcome sight seeing the king on a walkabout, chatting and shaking hands with well-wishers after attending the traditional Easter Sunday service at Windsor Castle yesterday. In a rare public appearance since he was diagnosed with cancer, the 75-year-old looked in good spirits as he was joined by the queen and other members of the royal family. But one guest at the service who didn't have as much of a warm reception was the disgraced Prince Andrew. You could say he is risen and is standing firmly with the royal family. To discuss this and more, I'm joined by the host of the To Die For Daily podcast, the wonderful Kinsey Schofield. Kinsey, were you surprised to see uh, Prince Andrew standing by his brother's side there? You know, I understand that it's protocol, JJ, but you're probably going to get this more than uh, a normal anchor would. Uh, there are two scripted dramas coming out about uh, Prince Andrew, within the next few weeks, within the next few months, we're going to see back-to-back -back 
scripted uh, content via Netflix, via Amazon Prime, all about this um, BBC interview that rocked the royal family. It is not a positive reflection on the royal family. It brings them back to a very chaotic time. Uh, and I just don't understand PR wise how he continues to slide through the cracks when um, I think that he is ultimately an embarrassment on the family. I mean, I if he says he's innocent of what he's accused of, I'll take him at his word, but it is guilt by association and Jeffrey Epstein is a convicted pedophile in the United States. Yeah, that's the thing. Look, Andrew, and I, I believe him, I've no reason not to believe him. He says he never met the woman in question. He paid her a few million quid to settle the, settle the, the, uh, the whole case, but he says he didn't meet her. He says that photo was a fake. He says he's not able to sweat. I believe him. He was in a, a Pizza Express instead. He was never at that party. I believe you, Andrew. You're not guilty. That is fine. However, you were mates with a paedophile. You knew he was a paedophile, and you flew out to hang out with him after he was convicted of being a paedophile. For that reason alone, I think he should be kicked out of the royal family and sent to some desert island somewhere to sit by himself and wallow in his self-pity. Uh, but with this uh, drama coming out on Netflix, Scoop, about the Emily Maitlis interview on Newsnight, men many, many millions more people around the world are now going to be made aware of this story. Not many people watched the, the original interview on BBC around the world, certainly not. In this country, a lot of us watched it, but globally, absolutely not. Surely King Charles should be thinking to himself, I'm about to get in a world of bad publicity because of my stupid brother. Why is he? Why did he keep him around then? You know, I would I would assume that would, is what he'd be thinking. But ultimately, JJ, I I think that this family is closer than we give them credit for. You know, I I know we're haunted by the Harry and Meghan, and I I know we're haunted by the Dianas in the room, and and this feeling that this family can be ice cold. But at the end of the day, the fact that we continue to see Prince Andrew, the fact that they slowly have, you know, and, uh, did you know that Fergie was recently in a Hallmark movie? A Hallmark, I mean, what? that is literally where Meghan Markle started her career. <laughs> and Fergie has come full circle. She's getting to, you know, have her cake and eat it too. She gets to show up at church with the king and she gets to play actress in Los Angeles. This is exactly what we're condemning Meghan Markle <laughs> for. And so I do feel like perhaps this family is a lot closer than we give them credit for because of um, some of the, some of the issues in, the, in their past. Why is it then that Randy Andy can still be accepted into the family fold, he's still listed on the website and everything, but Harry and Meghan, who are literally making their own money, doing their own thing, away from the royals, the public aren't paying for them anymore, they're making their own millions, but they're still getting hates. How is it, how, like, how does that work? Why does that work? I think that that works because Harry and Meghan have been openly critical of the royal family and uh, Prince Andrew and Fergie have been very tight lipped. I mean, aside from Fergie's book where she goes into detail about how one of Princess Diana's shoes gave her warts, which is like, let's be honest, that was pretty rude. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, Fergie's been pretty, you know, when it comes to the royal family, she's she's given them. Uh, a lot of great press. You know, she's been glow she was glowing about the queen when the queen was still alive. And so I think it's based on attitudes and and how Harry and Meghan have have been really critical all over the world about this family and, and Andrew and, and Fergie, while their behavior has been highly questionable, they have not typically been critical of the family. It just seems crazy to me that uh, a couple of people who know the royal family inside and out and are part of the firm, they leave, they're, they're critical of this establishment and the world turns on them and hates them. Meanwhile, you've got Andrew who is hanging out with a paedophile and getting paid money to give, give people access to the royal family. And it's like, oh yeah, but it's Andrew. You know, they've been quest questionable behavior. It's a bit more than questionable, I would say. No, I, I think that anyone that with any common sense wonders why Prince Andrew still has the access that he, he has, because he could still just be a welcomed family member already sitting inside the church, already inside of Sandringham waiting for everyone to arrive. He could be hidden in plain sight. Um, yeah. uh, you know, and for some reason, they've given him permission to be this uh, character that is at the forefront a lot of the times. And um, I think that that it, it's, uh, it's unsettling to a lot of us. Well, it's four years since Megxit. I don't even like calling it that. It's four years since Harry and Meghan left the royal family. But reports are now that they are classed as the joke of Hollywood over there. Is that true? 
I, I think that the the what's happened is that, that people have been given permission to make fun of them. When they first left and they first did that Oprah Winfrey interview, uh, you saw people very protective of them. They really had a, almost a shield of victimhood. So you weren't allowed to criticize them. Remember when Bethany Frankel posted something on TikTok criticizing Harry and Meghan after the Oprah interview? And she posted another one saying, I had to immediately delete that because someone very big and powerful called me and told me I didn't understand what I was talking about and to delete it. Um, you know, when Harry released Spare, you saw uh, some vulnerabilities there and all of a sudden people had permission to make fun of them. Um, you know, for instance, JJ, Meghan Markle was an influencer and was, uh, you know, a, a blogger and an Instagrammer before she married Harry, and she was respected in that in, in that environment. The Guardian recently wrote something teasing her about Harry's book Spare, saying that if she's going to be like Gwyneth Paltrow and she's going to um, have some sort of goop type product, that instead of a candle, maybe she could do a frostbitten todger cream. <laughs> These are things you couldn't say uh, four years ago. These are things you wouldn't have said about Meghan Markle 10 years ago. So it feels like in being vulnerable or in oversharing, Harry and Meghan have opened themselves up to criticism and opened themselves up to becoming the butt of the, uh, the, butt of the joke. I think it's okay to be the butt of the joke sometimes. I think that's all right. And it shows that they're human. They're not going to put out some uh, cease and desist order against South Park or The Simpsons for taking the, the mickey out of them, are they? So I think that's a good thing. But very quickly, on Meghan's rebrand and her selling todger cream, perhaps, or vagina-scented candles, do you think it's going to be a success? Is this going to make her a few, few million quid or even maybe many, many millions? I think that it's a no-brainer. I, I, she does have an established audience that wants what she's selling. So I don't see that there, I don't think that there's any harm in her pursuing this. I think that if, she, if she's got a product that people would buy, why wouldn't you do it? That's America. Yeah. And would you be buying anything from her? What, what has she got to sell for you to be like, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll take some of those. I don't know because I'm into like like bright colors. I'm not really into the beige. Uh, you know, I love Gwyneth Paltrow's. Uh, I love Gwyneth Paltrow's skincare line. So if she did something similar, maybe I would do that. Well, you know what I would do if I was Megan. I would take a diffusion mm. line dedicated to Prince Harry of all weed, marijuana. It's legal over there, right? In some of your states. Perfect. That's what I should Wait, do. Wait, JJ. She has a she has a cousin, or she has so, somebody that has a Markle weed brand out here. Oh well, there you go. It's perfect. Kinsey Schofield. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. You are watching the Independent Republic of JJ. Still to come, hundreds of patients a week in England may have died unnecessarily because of A and E waiting times. Don't go anywhere. We are back after the break. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, sir. Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey. Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening, and welcome to the Independent Republic of JJ. You're with Talk on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Coming up, more than 250 people are dying every week in hospitals in England due to long waits in A&E, say emergency physicians. Water firms are due to committing environmental vandalism by spilling sewage into bathing areas. And fury after a women's football team featuring five trans players obliterates its opposition 10-0 in a women's league. Let's talk about the royals. I mean, seriously, are we supposed to just forget Prince Andrew's whole Epstein debacle like it never even happened? Now we're seeing him gallivanting around with the royal family like he's earned back some sort of honour. Is this what we're supposed to accept? That a man associated with such disturbing allegations can just simply waltz back into royal life as if nothing ever happened. And let's not overlook the fact that this is the first time we are seeing our beloved King Charles out and about since his cancer diagnosis. Yet, yeah, Prince Andrew seems to be the one who stole the spotlight. It's a slap in the face to decency and accountability. It's like they're saying, sure, he might have some skeletons in his closet, but let's just brush them under the rug and carry on as usual. Well, I refuse to stand by silently while they parade around, pretending everything's hunky-dory. We deserve better as a country. The royal family needs to wake up and realise they can't sweep their problems under the rug and expect us to just smile and wave along with them. Well, I've got a suggestion. Why doesn't the grand old Duke of York take a one-way flight to Epstein Island and just stay there? Later in the show, we will be bringing you a first look at tomorrow's front pages. But before anyone else, we've got an exclusive look at the Sun newspaper. So, inside there, we have uh, the headline, Defiance, JK, goes to war against trans zealots. That is the author of Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling. So she has basically said, uh, ad addressing this, uh, what I would call a dr draconian new hate speech law that's kicked in in Scotland, um, that, yeah, she's, she's not going to just stand around and take it. Uh, she taunted police by using the hashtag arrest me. <laughs> uh, she posted a series of barbs at trans women, criminals and activists. So, I mean, JK is furious. She is angry. Um, and I, I completely... Understand that? Completely agree with her. She laid into Scottish First Minister Humza Yousaf uh, and his Hate Crime and Public Order Act 2. I stand with JK on this completely. Now, South West Water is claiming it has no legal obligation to keep rivers and seawater clean of sewage, stating that even during the bathing season, there is no absolute right to swim each day. This comes as the Liberal Democrats are accusing water companies of environmental vandalism for the 228,098 hours of sewage they discharged into bathing areas just last year. I'm joined now by the director of Windrush Against Sewage Pollution, Vaughan Lewis. Vaughan, what do you have to say about a private company telling me and you and the public that we have no right to go swimming in our seas? 
Uh, I don't know when anybody decided we had no right to swim in our seas or even our rivers. Whose idea was that? Yeah, it's absolutely ridiculous. But is there not already some kind of law or regulation in place that's, that should stop these companies from just dumping their sewage in, in, in the rivers and the seas? Uh, absolutely, JJ, of course there is. Yeah, there are strict rules and regulations that all water companies have to adhere to. I mean, this year, you, your figures were slightly wrong. It's 530,000 hours, JJ, this year, wow. which is up from 290,000. So you al almost double. Mm. And if you put that into real time, that's 60.5 years of sewage spilled into seas and waters in the southwest region. A lot of that illegally. And across the country, uh, in total, it's 3.6 million hours of untreated sewage spilled. 3.6 million hours. And that is just outrageous. Most of that, or a lot of that, spilling will be illegal. It's controlled by the Environment Agency, but I'm afraid the sheriffs have left the town. And at the moment, the water companies seem to be acting at times of impunity. And this poke by um, Southwest Water back at a really decent woman, Joe Bateman, and we've had Mr. Bates versus a post office. We may have Joe Bates versus Southwest, Joe Bateman rather, versus Southwest Water now. Uh, it's a poke back <coughs> and it's a cheap shot. And they really need to get their act together as do all of the other water companies. I mean, 66% of people in Britain said that they would like to see water companies abolished and some kind of not-for-profit organisations taking their place. Yeah, it's essentially like they're just fly-tipping. If you or I just went and dumped our rubbish down some alleyway, the cops will be onto us. But they are essentially just fly-tipping sewage into the waterways. And this comment that Southwest Water made, it's just, it's as if they are polluting on purpose and they, they do not care and they're going to continue to do it then. They are polluting on purpose. It, you know, these companies have made a deliberate deliberate pollute for profit decision across Britain, across England anyway. It's it's outrageous, you know, you, and you can see the consequences of the, uh, the, the equity stripping that's happened across the region with Thames Water now facing, you know, bankruptcy and extinction um, within the next few weeks if the government doesn't step in and change the rules to protect it. Um, they've got massive debts between 15 and 18 billion, depending on who you talk to. They're operating illegally. And some of their directors now of their parent company are leaving. They're resigning. And I think they're getting out before um, the deck chairs on, on, on the Titanic are finally arranged. So what damage is this doing to our coastlines, our ecosystem? Well, like, are, we, are our fish dying? Are our waters so polluted that we can't even fish in them in some parts? In some rivers, yeah. I mean, you know, the evidence is quite clear. You're showing some good pictures there, of, or some horrible pictures, actually, of sewage pouring into rivers, um, sewage fungus, high phosphorus levels, um, levels of, um, of uh, various chemicals, antimicrobial resistant bacteria. There's, you know, you name it, we're getting it. Some of the impacts are quite clear. You see dead fish, that's immediate. That's a catastrophic you know, acute impact, but we're getting chronic impacts, which will, you know, they'll surface over the years and we'll see it and we'll wonder who let this happen. And, you know, we know who let this happen and we need time to change. Right, so, and why is there so much sewage being discharged? The neglect, it's, 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 a, it's a failure to invest. I mean, oh, uh, you know, 1989, water privatisation, these water companies were given a, a, a set of assets with a clean book. And they have managed to rack up massive debts and they have taken something around 70 billion pounds in, in, in uh, dividends in the meantime. They've just stripped everything out. They've not invested. There's been no true equity investment in Thames Water ever since uh, privatisation. And most of it has been managed by debt. And chickens are coming home to roost. There is no money. They can't repair it. And they're refusing to put that money in. Well... Uh, some of the companies are saying that heavy rainfall, uh, an unusually heavy rain, rainfall last year, is partly to blame for for, the, for for this sewage over and everything else. But you're not buying that, then? Well, it's either heavy rainfall or the water pixies. It's never the water companies. I mean, heavy rainfall happens. They warn us about climate change. In interestingly, the water companies grab climate change as a thing to um, excuse them for not uh, having enough water in the summer and they grab climate change as an excuse for pouring sewage into our rivers during the rest of the year. 
So it strikes me they can't have it both ways. And it's not climate change's fault, it's happening. We've known that for a long time. Um, you know, you can, you can take a view on how bad it is, but it certainly is occurring. And they needed to have adapted, to have adapted, and they haven't. They've just let the infrastructure rot, and literally rot in places, and they've taken the money. So the Times have been running their Clean Up Our uh, Waters campaign. I know that there's a Surfers Alliance who are going to be doing some strikes uh, in the coming months as well. But what can we do? Uh, us as normal citizens, what can we do to try and effect some change? Well, I mean, you know, the obvious thing is, is, is right, right to, right to MPs, right to papers. You could protest. I mean, there's quite a lot of nice peaceful protests. Um, great one at Whitstable, Save Our Seas Whitstable, fantastic. It took over the beach, dressed in red, brilliant. Really visual expression of people's displeasure. Some folk are withholding payment. That's a growing movement. You know, I, I wouldn't suggest that to anybody, but people are doing that. And I think that movement is growing and that may well turn round to be a real problem to the water companies. But protest, protest, be angry. Be angry in a nice way, but be angry with what's happening. Mm. And what about a government? Whether it's this Tory government or whether it's the, the next government, which I presume will be be led by Keir Starmer, what, what can they and what should they be doing? I think people have had enough of the privatised pollute for profit model. And I think most people now, at least, you know, 67%, 66% of people asked said they were, they were happy to have a form of public ownership. And there's lots of different models, mutual models, municipalisation. It doesn't have to be full and um, nationalisation. We can be more subtle than that. But really, the, the, the pollute for profit private industry is it's almost unique in, in, in this country. Most countries in the world now have, have, have got a state owned or a not for profit water industry. It's so important. It's like, you know, someone trying to privatise the air around us. It just doesn't work. Well, the fact that even one of our great British institutions, the Oxford Cambridge Boat Race, is in danger uh, of not being able to happen to continue again. We just saw one of the, one of the rowers uh, fell sick because of the high levels of E. coli in the Thames. What these water companies are doing is absolutely criminal. And I, I just cannot believe that they are getting, that they've, got, well, they've gotten away with it thus far. And from the looks of it, they're going to continue to get away with it. Yeah, I mean, you know, what, what, what can only hope that the Environment Agency and off what the regulators actually start fighting back and pulling their weight and doing what they're supposed to do. But this government and other governments, I'm sure, will, will find any excuse to protect this model. Um, it, 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 it's, it's crazy. They, they, they are, you know, they're, they're forming, they're forming a, a lager around a, a dead and dying beast. They need to just put it out of its misery, change the model and move on. Then it, it may still be a mess, but it will be our mess and we can all see what's going on. It will be transparent. We will have um, good access into, into what's happening with money. And there will be some accountability through democratic local means. I mean, that's what's missing. Decent regulation and decent accountability for our money. I mean, Thames are putting our bills up or, or want to put our bills up 50%. That's unacceptable. That's utterly unacceptable. Yeah. Well, Vaughan Lewis, director of the uh, Windrush Against Sewage Pollution, thank you very much for your time. OK, thank you, Jedi. Nice to speak to you. Bye-bye. Now, A and E weights are seeing hundreds of patients in England dying unnecessarily each week. A new study from the Royal College of Emergency Medicine found there was likely to be an excess death for every 72 patients who spent 8 to 12 hours in the emergency departments. And the longer the wait, the greater risk of death. Joining me now to discuss this is former NHS Trust Chairman and Health Policy Analyst Roy Lilly. Good evening, Roy. Uh, Good evening. Do these figures come as a surprise? No, not really. I mean, the Royal College of Emergency Medicine has been banging away about this for ages. Let me give you the background to the numbers. The NHS calculates excess deaths on what's called a rolling average, a rolling five-year average. So they take all the deaths over five years create an average, and then they look at today's deaths compared against the rolling average. Now, the rolling average deaths went up, of course, during COVID and after COVID, and they're starting to tail off, taper off now. Throughout that period, um, the Royal College of Emergency Medicine have been saying, look, there are excess deaths because of COVID, of course, but there is an underlying trend here as well. 
And it was very convenient for the Department of Health to say, well, no, I mean, the data is complicated. It's obfuscated by COVID and it, it can't be right. But now, of course, everything they've said is coming true because the COVID deaths are starting to taper off. And you can look at the excess deaths with, without the, the complication of COVID and, and you can correlate them against the, the rolling average. And that's where the excess deaths come from. And the uh, Royal College of Emergency Medicine is saying that the principal cause of these deaths are people being delayed in their care in A and E. And it's, I mean, it, you don't have to be a doctor or a statistician, really, it's common sense. Delayed care is dangerous care. And if something like this happens, then people will die waiting. And that's the, the sad truth. See, I was sceptical when I first um, read these numbers, these figures. I was sceptical, but you're saying that this estimation and the link between long waits, that's it. That it, 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 it's completely true. Yes, I mean, there's an undoubted correlation to that because one of the confounding factors in the numbers is the fact that people are waiting a long time in A&E. And, you know, we know from death certificates and we know from cause of death um, really what the numbers mean. And so we've been able to to spot where where the excess deaths are coming from. So and, and as I say, I mean, this doesn't this is not new. This isn't sort of new data that suddenly come out of nowhere. This is, these are the numbers that we've been getting uh, as an underlying cause for some time. And of course, you know, the, the doctors and nurses that work in A&E, they, they're not fools. They know exactly what's going on. You get people uh, come in blue light through the front door of A&E. 40% of people that go to A&E are likely to need an inpatient, a period of inpatient admission. Now, A&E is a, a magic place where, you know, miracles happen by the day, but their job in A&E is to stabilise people and to make sure that, uh, that they don't lose their lives. So they're stabilised, but then they have to get onto the ward where the, the, the next layer of magic happens, where people are really cared for. They maybe go to, to surgery, they're looked after on the wards, uh, and, that, and that's where the specialists come in and then they'll see an orthopaedic person or a cardiac person or what have you. So A&E kind of stabilises the situation, then you get onto the ward. If you get stuck in the no man's land between the <laughs> cardiac ward, for example, and A&E, often in a corridor because A&E is chock-a-block, that's when the risk happens. Now, you know, the A&E uh, staff are getting quite good at managing this sort of no man's land and even some... Uh, hospitals now, uh, or during the hiatus last year, had corridor nurses whose job it was to, to look after and maintain uh, people in corridors on trolleys. But the difficulty is, when A&E gets chock a block like that, the reason for that is that that probably one in three people on the wards didn't need to be there. They needed to be discharged. Often they're elderly and frail, and they can't be discharged because social services who are the sort of the, the sister of, of the NHS aren't able to arrange what we call domiciliary care packages. These are the fabulous people that come in the morning and get your granny up and get her out of bed, give her a wash, make sure she has a breakfast, maybe come in for lunch and then twilight services in the evening. Those services are really very, very important to get people home safely because while someone might be medically fit to go home, uh, the, the medically fit to leave the hospital. They're not really fit enough to look after themselves at home. They're at risk. So you have to wait for social care to arrange the domiciliary care packages. Social care, you know, they, they've had their budget, uh, I think their budget cuts are about 40% over uh, the last 10 years. They just simply don't have the money. The domiciliary care sector is dominated by mainly by very small companies who are just struggling at the margins. And so you get a situation where people are in hospital, could go home but can't, so they're occupying a bed, which means the people waiting in A&E and in the corridors can't get onto the ward where they get their proper care. They get chock a block and then the A&E gets full and then we see pictures of ambulances queuing up outside A&E. So the, the NHS is really a large sort of production line. It's, you know, sick and poorly people go in at one end and then hopefully fit and happy people come out the other. Uh, and and you, if you get an interruption in what we call flow through the hospital, that's where the wheels come off. And that's really what we're talking about with these numbers. OK, so bed blocking is a factor then. Um, I was in A&E just last week. I took my son in, 
We were in and out within four hours. It felt like a long time, but it wasn't a 12 hour wait. So I yeah. guess these figures are not reflective of every single A&E department across the country. But is there some kind of, I don't know, A&E league table of some sort where people can go and look and see what, where their hospital ranks. And maybe if you can drive yourself to A&E, you don't go to your nearest one. You're going to go to one two towns over. Well, there used to be, uh, there used to be A&E targets, the four hour target, of course, but that's been largely abandoned. They're trying now to get 74% uh, of patients through A&E in a four-hour time. But, I mean, it's, it's really difficult to do. What we found with COVID, actually, is a, a lot of people uh, coming in who are much sicker. And the average length of stay has gone up as well. So the dwell time in the hospital is longer. As far as, as uh, diverting to a hospital where the waiting time might be less, yes. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the NHS app, um, which has been actually they've done a fantastic job with it. I don't know if you've downloaded the app, but there's a lot of things you can do with it. And they're developing it to try and get some real time numbers so people can see how they're doing. The difficulty with that is that, is that you, know, you can imagine it's the A&E are linking up here 250 hospitals throughout the country. And the other difficulty is, I mean, you know, you and I are talking to each other in London. The big thing in London is that we've got loads of hospitals. But in big parts of the country, major parts of the country, there is really only one what we might call a district general hospital. So there isn't a lot of choice and there aren't choices of where people can go. So we do depend on the efficiency and the throughput of the hospitals. OK, well, thank you very much, Roy Lilly, for your time. A great pleasure. Good evening. Good evening. So um, you've been getting in touch with your comments about the NHS it doesn't make good reading, let me tell you. Uh, Sheldon says, the vast majority don't need A&E. The system is utterly clogged. Carol says, the NHS was not made to service the whole world. Population growing significantly. What do they expect? And Sue says, well, Sue is pointing to immigration. Uh, with a population the size of Liverpool entering the country every year, what does one expect? But then again, we keep getting told that we need mass immigration to help the economy. So surely we should be rolling in it. And uh, Jack says, do not get sick in this country. And if you do, for your sake, do not go to hospital. OK, after the break, outrage after a Met officer says swastikas need to be taken into context. You do not want to miss this. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family 
And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved another on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching The Independent Republic of JJ. Now, this is the best video you are going to see today. It's from NASCAR on NBC this weekend, where NASCAR racer Joey Gase's car was damaged and spun out of the race, which he seemed to think was the fault of his rival, Dawson Cram. So he ripped the bumper off his damaged vehicle, walked over to the car still racing, waited for Cram to come by, and then threw the bumper at the car. That is literally the ultimate in bad sportsmanship. The cost of an annual BBC TV licence has shot up from £159 to £169.50 after a two-year freeze ended. Let's bring back my panel, get some reaction from this. Keith, BBC, I don't, I don't want to bash the Beeb, but this seems like a lot of dough. Listen, I'm going to uh, speak openly here. I will not be renewing my BBC licence. Yes. Are you going to get rid of your TV? Uh, I have got a TV. And uh, I'm not going to watch live broadcasts because I understand you don't uh, need a licence if you don't watch live broadcasts. Well, but I ever can. since, and you know what I'm going to say here, ever since the war in Gaza and the BBC's irresponsible reporting on this issue, and, uh, and it just has... It's made me think to myself, why would I want to pay to hang myself in public, mm. such as the rise in anti-Semitism in today's society in this country? I will not be renewing my BBC licence. I'm not going to give you my address to knock on the door, the inspectors, <laughs> but I'm telling you right now. So you think BBC are, are partly to blame for the rise in anti-Semitism in this country? 100%. I think, listen, don't get me wrong, talk TV, great. But generally, the media with their reporting and the BBC specifically, I know a number of things about the BBC, like, for example, their BBC Arabic service. I know this because I have people over there. They do not have one Arabic-speaking... Um, English journalist over there um, knowing what has been put out on their Arabic uh, news channel. Mm. BBC I call the biased broadcasting corporation and even if they put their, their licence fee down, I wouldn't give them a penny. I do, I do feel sorry for the BBC, um, particularly when you cite sort of the, 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 the war in Gaza at the moment because no news station will have an easy time with it. Now, I do find it baffling that they didn't they refused to call Hamas terrorists even though they were a designated terrorist group by the UK. I completely take your point there. Um, but I don't think covering... The, the the war in, which, which has so many sensitivities about it is an easy job anyway. I actually think the BBC are going to lose um, license fees of subscribers because of YouTube mainly because you don't have to pay if you watch YouTube or you use streaming services like Netflix and Amazon and unfortunately they're, they're dominating the space. You can basically get everything online. Talk TV is moving online. You, I mean, most, most news stations are streamed online now. So really, what is the case for the BBC I don't, in the current model, I don't really see Well, it. let's go to my legal advisor. I, I will tell you exactly what the position is. Online is the new front line, you're absolutely yeah. right. And you do not make money from news. And what you do need is that the question, I, I, as you know, host for the Royal Television Society. I do their podcast for them. And I interviewed the great and good of the BBC. We celebrated the centenary. And my question to them was, well, what's next, next hundred years? So the question was not how, well, the first question is, do we need the BBC? And the basic answer to that is, well, do you need a public broadcaster who is independent of commercial objectives, independent yes. of reliant on that sort of stuff? It therefore needs to be financed in some sort of way. Yeah. What they were talking about is, well, let's look at the different ways that you could finance it. And I personally believe that it should be available to everybody, which means that it should be perhaps means tested mm -hmm. so that you can uh, you can look at that sort of side. Because otherwise, broadcasters will not be doing the great content that the BBC Me means does. Test means testing is, is, is completely unsustainable. I think, yes, you should have a public broadcaster to 
maintain certain standards because uh, companies, media companies that are commercially driven obviously have an agenda. Yes. Absolutely. Um, I do think you need to cut out all the fluff. There's so many things that the BBC offers that it shouldn't. It shouldn't, the, the Strictly's of the world and all these. Why shouldn't it offer Strictly's? It's well, well, because, it's, because we, we, we have enough sources of entertainment. That's the point. If you have a public broadcaster that's there to maintain standards, certain journalistic standards and certain standards within news, which again, it has a tough job doing, but I think you should have that on, in principle. Yeah. You don't need Strictly. You can, if you want to watch something dancey, you can watch it on Netflix. But, and, and, and you're right also, and, and that, that was the other question, because you're getting great things, you're getting great dramas yeah, and so honestly, on and so if, forth. If the, and you look at that sort of stuff. cut to like 50 quid a year, but it only gave us the essentials in news and in, in public information and things that like BBC, for instance, that students use yes. to learn. Fine, that's fine. Yeah. But everything else, all the fluff, all so the... So you get rid of uh, all the dramas, all the period oh, absolutely. dramas. absolutely. Mm -hmm. No more strictly. Well, everyone even, else even, is even doing though, period yeah, dramas. But so what? Other channels are doing news. By that, by that sense, you know, well, they, they, do don't, they don't need to do we news. We do news, so the BBC stopped doing they're, news. They're what all, are they doing? They're, they're to be educated. Other, not teachers. Other independent channels and their commercial model is down Strictly to is one of their most popular... But if the BBC... Yeah. Yeah. If the is one of the most popular shows. Let the ITV buy it. Let ITV buy it. And you can also look at those sort of things, because there's two sides to the BBC. One is the stuff which is financed through the licence fee. The other is the commercial arm. Yeah. And actually, I'm, I'm going down this time next week. I'll be in Cannes, the TV festival, no. uh, where I present down there yeah, and do various other things. Yeah. But they're selling programs. And the BBC is one of the biggest brands in the world in terms yeah. of broadcasting. Yeah. And that's what you look at. So the financing is slightly different there. The point about means testing is not you don't want the laborious side of it, but people who can't afford it, you may, may do it on the tax returns or whatever, yeah, yeah, they can yeah. generally should have access to this content. It should punch way above its weight in terms of quality and trust and everything else. That's what we need to look at. So I think, but these things cost money. But you need so to be able to have somebody that, as an independent would, broadcaster. If you means test it, the people that can afford it will just say, actually, I probably don't need it. And so you have a smaller and smaller pool of people, the wealthier people in this means testing model that will just drop off a cliff. I don't, and I don't think, think so. that's sustainable. Wealthy people will just keep on paying for everything. But Keith, <laughs> what, <laughs> Keith, what if you, that's um, what if, what if BBC put out an apology? End of this year, they put out an apology and they say, you know what, we've had a look through, we've, we've done what the police do, we've marked our own homework, we've, we've ported ourselves to Ofcom and we've come out and we're going to say, actually, we apologise to the world, not to the Jewish community, but to the world for our bias reporting. Look, it, listen, Would you come back to I, I don't know if you know, many years ago, a number of years ago, you had the Bainham Report, which is actually an independent study conducted to see if the BBC were biased. They spent over a half a million of British taxpayers' money not revealing the contents of the Bainham Report because yeah. they were scared of what was going to be revealed. I'm sorry, that is more taxpayers' money down the drain. Honestly, BBC is dated, the, the licence fee is dated. People don't even want to watch the BBC. I watch talk TV principle. all day, every day, and I don't need the BBC. <laughs> so how, how would you, find, but, but, but to be fair though, how would you finance the BBC? I wouldn't. You wouldn't? If they want to go commercial and finance it the but way they, they... they don't want to go commercial. Most that, of their income the comes from... If, but the point is this, if they go commercial, there's certain programming that will not be made yeah. because it's not commercial. Yeah, okay. You do not make money from news. That, that, that's the reality. Everyone will tell you you don't make money from news. You've, you've got to work then on the basis that if we need those programmes, and never, we live in a diseased information age at the moment. Mm -hmm. I, I, do, I also host something called Fake or Fact, where you're looking at that sort of stuff, the whole thing about fake news, challenging those sort of stories. We need some independent public broadcasters who basically can hold people's feet to the fire and examine those things. Well, oh, no, and I that agree, needs to be financed. Well, if you'd like to know any more about what Eborn does when he's not here, <laughs> I'll just go, follow him on Twitter. Let's move on. <laughs> Actually, Andrew uh, Eborn, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the trans football team battering the women's team in Australia. You might have heard my rant about it. What earlier. a surprise. What a surprise. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. No, the reality, I, I, your brilliant rant, and well done. You're entitled to rant about these sort of things. Uh, respect I, is always key, but it's respect for all people in the conversation. Mm -hmm. The reason certain sports divide it between those who have sort of physical strength and those who have a different physical strength is exactly that. Yeah. So if you introduce people who have a bigger physical strength, of course they're going to win. Yeah. So, so that makes sense. And I, I, I totally understand you need to have respect for everybody in the conversation, but it does also mean respect for the female athletes yeah. um, who are physically less able, or less strong rather, yeah. not able, on that sort of basis. If they all want to play darts, that's fantastic. If it's football or lifting weights or whatever it is, it's unfair. I don't, I don't care what it is. It's, if it's, if, so far as it's a sport, men and women, 
that is the end of the conversation. It doesn't need to be darts or anything else because there will always be a physical difference. I, I despise this argument that actually it should be based on weight and testosterone levels and hormone levels and all mm. of that because then you can have a woman that's extraordinary in, t- in the women's category, but then she might be pushed into the men's category because she might be a medium or below a- 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 an average or below average performer for the men's category, which is just strange. Like Why, why are you putting, li- you're, you're, you're falsifying and putting limits to men and women's abilities in sports? And I think that's ludicrous. Just just to what? To please like 10 people? No, I, I, it's crazy. The world, has, the world has gone utterly mad. And actually, I said to you last time I was on here, I'd like to bang my head against a brick wall. So I printed one out. Right? <laughs> and I'm, <laughs> going to, I'm actually going to bang my head against a brick wall. <laughs> because let me tell you something. This world has gone mad. Of course, yes. women, uh, men should not be con- putting a skirt on and competing in a women's tennis match. You know what? One of the most That's woke, horrifying. One of the most woke was tennis... Dangling? Can you imagine a man in a skirt playing it's tennis? It's ridiculous. What's, what's Listen, let me give you a reverse example, OK? I um, host a tennis podcast, Rock and Roll Tennis, for any of you guys who <laughs> want, to, want to tune in. But listen... <laughs> Serena Williams. How do you find out? Listen to it. <laughs> Ser- 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 Don't exactly. pay the license fee. <laughs> Don't pay. Don't Harry, pay that ask. fee, whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. Serena Williams, yes. who most people recognise as the most, possibly the best women's tennis player mm-hmm. ever, many people recognise that her power was almost that of a man. But when John McEnroe, a few yes. years ago, said if she was playing in a men's game, she wouldn't beat the man, uh, uh, the, any man in the top 800, mm-hmm. she lambasted him. OK? It's a kind of similar sort of thing. Women, as you said, uh, Esther, women in women's sports, men in men's sports. End of story. Yeah. But, but look at the mischief. And this is the whole reason it was set up in that sort of difference. And as they say, But it's also about respect, just to put a bit of balance on it. I don't mind people, if, if, whatever they want to do, they, if they will identify as a woman, let them identify as a woman. But there is a difference in terms of sport and so on and so forth. Yeah. And I think respect involves respect for everybody in the conversation. Yeah, you know, uh, there's, you know, there's no rules in the Premier League or anywhere in the English Football Association. There's no rule saying that women cannot play with the men. Like women that. can play with the men. The reason there's no women playing with the men is because they're not good enough to get into any of those teams. In the same way, I'm not playing in the Premier League because I'm not good enough. It's the same, but there are rules yeah. in women's football that men cannot play because we are stronger. If you go in a tackle, a 50-50, yeah. man versus woman, the woman is going to get injured. But, and yeah. this but is why you had the differences introduced in the first place. This is why you introduced the difference between uh, biological sex as it originally sort of started. Yeah. And without being inflammatory in terms of the language, look at the differences. If sport didn't matter about those physical differences, then you just have, I, I say, this is why darts may be slightly different and so on and so forth, or snooker, uh-huh. you can do that sort of thing. But things like Formula One driving, when they encourage everybody, it's if it's skill-based, yeah. make, that makes sense. Well, but where are. there's an unfair physical advantage, it's rather like he- heavyweights in boxing or yeah. bantam weights and so on and so forth. You try and divide it up on that sort of basis. But I do want a system where I said the trouble, and every time we discuss this, it becomes so inflammatory, we need to make sure there is respect for everybody, mm-hmm. but work out the reasons there are the rules there in the first I, place. I, I, I don't even agree with the whole, even if you can't see physical differences, then don't segregate, because it's about the integrity of female sports. So it's not just about, OK, darts, you don't have that much physical differences between men and women, so you should be able to compete against each other. Yeah. It's the integrity of the sport. If it's a female sport oriented towards females, it should only have females. But end up. I don't care whether you know men and women would likely perform on the same level. Women have fought so hard to actually be recognized. I say this publicly, I don't watch women's football because it's terrible. It's god awful. Yeah. Yeah. That being said, you have to protect the integrity of the sport. But like, there are many women that have fought very hard but to as be I, given attention. But Esther, as I said earlier, it's women who are going to be the ones out crying now and saying, okay. how dare we speak about trans women and stop them from playing in sport? Yeah. You know what I mean? it it's ain't, mad women, yeah. It's mad women. But anyway, let's, let's stick with football. England Wags going to spend 100k on private bodyguards for the So the, 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 it's a bargain. So it's, <laughs> <laughs> What you have to look at is this, and I always look at these stories and you sort of turn around and say, well, how many people is that covering for and for how many days? I mean, how many wags are there? You work on the basis there's a team, but they've got one each and so on and so forth. If you're talking about security guards and how much time is being spent, then that's what's going to happen. If they're talking about private security. So there's two issues. There's one is the cost, which you need to divide down, well, how many wags and how many people make that make sense. The other is the more concerning thing, which is about safety mm-hmm. at these events. And this is the real concern because the increase in violence, the increase in terrorist threats and so on and so forth is absolutely horrendous. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm actually curious how they calculated that 100. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. That's, it's like a headline figure, but if you've got 22 wags or one person might have several wags. I don't, you, don't, you don't know how many wives and girlfriends there might be. That's what they need to look at. And how many security people is that paying for over what period? It probably is a highly rate, you know? You look yeah, at that exactly. sort of basis. Yeah. I must tell you, from what I've read, first of all, the wags are paying for it. 
That's the first thing. Well, first of all, let's get it right. They're not paying the for it. They've just been lucky it. enough to, to get their boyfriend's credit card and they're going to pay for it off that. Well done. But listen, the point is, this whole WAGs thing is a bit of a joke. Most of them haven't got a brain cell bet uh, between them. Oh! Right? No, you know what I mean? You can't Whoa. say that. No, no, no with you all due respect, right? They're, I mean, they're, I agree with they you. They are there. <laughs> thank you. They are there <laughs> because they bagged a footballer. And I've been in central London not, not for a long time, where you go to a nightclub and there's girls who turn up to a nightclub because they want to bag a... A, uh, a, a professional Is that the one where you pretend the to be a footballer? Is, is they the should not be anywhere near the, uh, the Euros because, let's face it, at the end of the day, the players need to concentrate on winning something. We haven't won anything for how many years? Was it 58 years? Well, they're there for moral support. Yeah, exactly. No, you're, you're absolutely support. wrong. They're, they're there, to, they're there to, 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 I would, to put Botox up, put some makeup on, I would, and improve their Instagram. I account. would say I would say that the wags we have today are not the good ones. Yeah, back no, in the day, no, the, back Victoria in, Beckham, quality, Cheryl, yeah, Apollyon, those are proper wags. Quality ones These now, are no just... Rooney versus Vardy, the best legal case we've had for a long time. You know what? The wags of the past were made of different stuff. You're right. And whilst I would I really disagree with that. So I have to say that women's football has got so good. It's and, terrible. And, and, Absolutely I, not. And, and you should, you should. Abe, Abe, Abe and, and, put but a sock in it. But it's got the nation. We, the, the, the football's coming home, but it was the lionesses who brought it. Yep. Home. Where's the that face? Abe, on. You can put a sock in it. <laughs> no, where are the <laughs> where are the women's, women's football? What about yeah? He can't even throw. He throws like a girl. Well, there's no pads. Husbands and boyfriends. Speaking of the Euros, though, it's going to be in Germany. Have a look at the German kit. Check this. Let's have a look. So this is. Been uh, oh lambasted because they're saying that that 44 looks like the SS. It does look like the SS. <laughs> it does, that, isn't it? That, that is not good. Right now, I don't know which player wears the oh, 44 for Germany. I think this kit is a homage to the one from 1990s. Really? But that, yeah, that I think it's from the bit, 1990s. I mean, that's. It, it, it does look, I mean, it's a little bit, the first time I saw, the, the, yeah. saw that, that, that's exactly what I thought. It's been listen, banned, it's been banned already. I'm not surprised it's been banned. And this has been the scandal this season about football kits. You know, it's like the England flag. What yeah. on earth have they done with that? Yeah. You know, a flag is a flag. You don't need to alter it. Work on that sort of basis. Well, we'll discuss that next, but, you know, just briefly on the flag. Nigel Farage used to ha have the union flag made purple when he was in charge of UKIP. Yeah. No one complained about that, did they? Well, I'm complaining now. Well, you're complaining you now. The flag. Good. You the flag. <laughs> Put it on the fish and chip shop, however, and that's different. <laughs> Um, Germany. Yes. Sticking in, I love Germany, so I'm staying there for three stories. Um, they have partially partially decriminalised cannabis. Keith, I bet you'll be happy about this, won't you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> look, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come clean. I have, in my <laughs> long history, uh -huh. have actually tried cannabis. Okay. okay? Oh. Yeah. Have you? Yeah. You're uh, never going to America now, mate. I, um, my <laughs> friend's ma He's not paid his licence fee. <laughs> All the lawyers are on the phone. I'm going to walk out of here with hand <laughs> stuff. But no, in all seriousness, I yes. went to Amsterdam many years ago with some yes. friends. And I've never, ever done drugs. And we went there. I remember we get, went into a cafe and I was eating hash cakes and I was smoking super skunk. Sorry, I, I, I shouldn't really be admitting to this. And I've got friends to this day. It suddenly hit me at the end of the day. I literally couldn't walk. My legs had turned to the leg. <laughs> I would never, and I never have done it again. And friends of mine still to this day mock me and say that when you OD'd on cannabis, <laughs> do I think it should be legal? You know what? Uh, it's a very I think, I think difficult... I think we're getting there. I mean, th the reason why Germany did this is because they're kind of sick of having uh, loads of Germans go over to, uh, to the Netherlands since they legalized, um, sort of legalized weed 50 years ago and going over there to smoke. So the, the, the Dutch have been like, listen, we're getting too many German tourists. Can you please do something about it? But I think eventually the UK will follow suit. Look, since 2010, 80% of all drug offenses have been for minor possession, right? We have 11,000 people in prisons on drug, drug offenses. We're spending all of this money. The war on drugs has failed. We've never had a formal review of, of the, the Drugs Act of 1971. 50 years of legislation that has clearly not worked because drug use has gone up through the roof. Um, drugs have become cheaper and more potent. And yet we've never reviewed failing drug policy. We're spending millions and millions of, yeah. of, of, of pounds on it every, or hundreds of millions actually. Or, but how far take it, Esther? Well, I mean, because, you know, yes, of course, you don't want a society You don't want a society of potheads. No. You, don't oh. want, you don't want a society where you're encouraging people to smoke marijuana. And, I get and the that. idea is But the, well way, the way to get around that isn't to ban it. You, it, have, exactly. to, you have to socialise it. Go on, I, I was going to just tell you what the rules are so, yeah. so people understand. It's basically from the 1st of April today, and it's not, not a, a full thing, over-18s can possess up to 25 
grams of cannabis in public, yeah. which is a lot. Uh, the adults can grow three plants, which are actually quite difficult to grow. He'll tell you why. <laughs> uh, but, but they are, so that's quite difficult. But people won't be allowed to smoke joints within sight of schools, sports centres or pedestrian zones between 7 and, and, and 8 o'clock. But from the 1st of July, they can start having social clubs where you get 500 members. Now, the idea is to stop the, the black marketing thing, to stop the drug dealers mm. and, and to work out a sensible way of having the conversation. But there's also the medicinal benefits of things like cannabis so that people should look at. So it's a sensible conversation about this. CBD. Get rid exactly. Now. Get rid of the myths about it because they say a lot of people say it's a gateway drug. Well, is it? We need to look at that sort of side. If it stops the criminalization uh, and, and gets the drug dealers out of the picture, that's got to be helpful. Well, I mean, the real the real question and the real problem is obviously cocaine yep. and, and methamphetamines and, and sort of higher class drugs. How do you deal with that? Of course, you don't want to legalize it, but at the same time, you know, the war on drugs has failed. Drugs has won. C you know, congratulations to drugs. And we need to find a way to, <clears throat> to stop lining the pockets of drug dealers by yeah. having by, by spending money on the wrong thing. Right. Well, during the break, I think we should have security come in and search Keith. <laughs> I, 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 he, he's a god of forever. <laughs> yeah. he, he's got more charges against him than Trump. <laughs> you are watching the Independent Republic of JJ. After the break, hot off the press, we take a look at some of tomorrow's front pages. We'll see you then. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved another on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham on Talk TV with me, JJ and Nisyobi. And now it's time for this. The World of Woke. 
Now, it doesn't take a genius to know that the swastika is a symbol of racism, but apparently it does take an idiot to defend its use. Our wonderful and great Met Police showed once more why they cannot be trusted to keep us safe. It's bad enough they don't seem interested in actually investigating crimes anymore, like shoplifting or burglaries, and I haven't been a fan of them in the way in which they target certain groups of using their power with stop and search, but I have to commend them for going above and beyond over the weekend to show the world how completely woke they've gone in what I assume is a bizarre, twisted attempt to not offend Nazis. We saw one copper actually try to claim that the swastika was not anti-Semitic. In footage taken during a pro-Palestine march in London, a woman can be seen telling a hapless officer that a different Bobby had told her that a swastika was not necessarily anti-Semitic or a description of public order. He starts explaining the public order act to the woman before she asks, could you just explain under what context the swastika is not disrupting public order? The officer replies, I haven't said anything about it. That it is or it isn't. Everything needs to be taken in context, doesn't it? Take a look at this. In what context is a swastika not anti-Semitic and disruptive public order? That's just my question. I don't have an in-depth knowledge of trying to see I know the swastika was used by the Nazi party during uh, their inception and the period of them being in power in Germany in the 1930s and 40s. I am aware of that. I just can't believe this conversation is actually happening. Uh, so what, what, what exactly are you confused about? What, what I'm confused is how you don't, in what context yeah. the swastika is not anti-Semitic. This is what I want to know. Because, again... Well, I suppose, to some, I don't know uh, how... Everybody would feel about that song. Are you having a laugh? Listen up, PC Pillock. There is no context in any world where the Nazi swastika is anything but a racist symbol. If you see a swastika anywhere, it's racist. It is undeniably anti-Semitic. What part of that don't you bloody get? The Met Police have stressed that the person with the swastika sign had already been arrested at the time of this conversation. But that's not quite good enough, is it? Why don't your officers actually know what a racist symbol is? Why won't they just say, yes, that symbol is anti-Semitic? Or are they too afraid of offending the Nazis? What are they going to do next? Tell us that Adolf Hitler wasn't all that bad, actually? Will we see Ku Klux Klan rallies on our streets with coppers excusing their presence, saying, well, we don't know if they're a racist group. They could just be dressed as ghosts for Halloween. So, Mark Rowley, these are your officers, and you need to get this sorted, because too many people in this capital do not feel safe with your bozo bobbies on the beats. The world of woke. Well, gosh, the panel is still with me. Yeah. Just a quick reaction off the back of that, that little rant of mine about the swastika let, and the Mets. Let me put it in perspective. You're absolutely right. It all depends on context. And it is... <laughs> no, 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 I'll tell you what it depends on context. The swastika is an ancient religious and cultural symbol. Is, is yes, what say. yes. It is important. But absolutely, in that context, it's clearly if it's a, a march it's and it's... Injured, and it's yeah. a, you need to look at that sort of stuff. But, and there, but there are still cultures around the world... But not, use it for but that not in the same... Not, it's a different symbol. The, the Nazis bastardised the original... Oh, no, you're, you're absolutely yeah. right. And that's why I say it's so important like, about context. Yeah. But that's... So, Obviously, just, the people carrying it during that the, it, exactly. there was to be insidious. We're using the Nazi swastika exactly. as well. Exactly. I, I do, the I do feel sorry for, for the police, though, because, again, there are good, hard-working police. I completely agree with you, JJ, that the Met Police needs to be completely disbanded and, and you have to bring back community policing with a vengeance and all of that. But, I mean, I just... I, I can't imagine being... <laughs> Obviously, we, we work in broadcasting, but I can't imagine being filmed as a police officer for making this 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 one one gaffe. It was obviously a mistake. One gaffe, uh, Jimmy. No, but it's, it was Keith, obviously a mistake. But Keith, I feel Keith, sorry Keith, for them. Keith, you are you are a practicing right. Jew. How do you feel about this? How do I feel about this? This is not just one incident. Uh huh. Okay. You've seen in recent weeks a guy holding up a sign, Hamas is terrorist, being pinned to the ground. Yeah. Okay. At these pro. Palestinian rallies, they're not actually pro-Palestinian rallies, they're anti-Israel rallies, anti-Jewish rallies in a lot of the cases mm -hmm. of people there. This is not an isolated incident. The police are not doing their job. Yes, I feel sorry for the police because they've got a hard job. I give you that, Esther. But the truth is, these marches have been 11 of them since the 7th of October. Not one of those people on those marches has said, release the hostages. Not one. Yeah. And, the, and you have people... With with the uh, star of David being um, bin. a yeah. picture of them like put in the yeah. bin and mm -hmm. all sorts of stuff like that and the police are doing zilch nothing and the point is this is not an isolated instance the police need to start doing their job Sadiq Khan I genuinely hope that uh, that you either do something or get voted out in May because this is just unacceptable well let's go to the front page of the Sun now. Uh, 
more furore about one of our flags. Union jokes is the headline. Ebon, tell me about this story. Well, look, I'll tell you, it's very simple. Look, this is yet another thing on the front page of the Glorious Sun. Here it is, Shem, look, uh, what I was saying earlier about uh, working on that sort of principle. The flag is the flag. You don't mess with the flag. What they're doing here is a design thing, which is helping to sort of peddle merchandise. And that's the biggest problem on this sort of stuff. You talk about Nigel, everybody's mate, Nigel Farage, <laughs> uh, working on, on that sort of basis. But you need to turn around, because otherwise people are easily going to get offence. Mm -hmm. And I think if you work on that sort of thing, this is the flag which is represented as the flag. This is a design thing to help peddle merchandise is a different aspect. Yeah, I, I personally, I don't hate this union flag. If they're doing it just for Team GB, I don't hate it. But I do think... They wouldn't go to Saudi Arabia and say to them, your flag's pretty good, guys, but we've made this one with some rainbows in it. Uh, what do you think? Are you absolutely right? This is the thing. I think we should give these, these manufacturers as much liberty as they want, with one exception. The flag, unadulterated, must be featured in a prominent position. Yeah. You can do whatever you want. You can have like a, you know a tap dancing monkey if you want to, but there must be a union jack. <laughs> there must be a union jack, as we yes. all know it, there, prominent, and, and for everyone to see. If you want to have a bunch of symbols or bozos yeah. around it, that's fine. But you cannot alter the British flag. I think that's fair because you wouldn't do it anymore. And that else. should be fair to everybody. And you're exactly. working, but, but you would think because about it's artistic it, license. Exactly. Yeah, but you have the their Olympics. Olympics during the Olympics. They they all do that. They, they, they look at the colours, the red, white and blue, and they come up with something creative. Mm -hmm. But I say that's the merchandising side of it. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. Have somewhere where it says, make, make it simple. The law must be, you must have the flag yeah. and represent it in that sort of way. But of course you can do wonderful things with the design. Exactly. And then people at won't least be a third arms. of the image must be Keith, the flag. I've got, yeah. I, I, I'm going to have to say something completely contrary. I've got a problem with it. And I'll tell you why I haven't got a problem with it. Why do you hate the our country, Olympic Keith? Games. Why do you hate our country? <laughs> <laughs> I love my country. <laughs> but hear me out. The Olympic Games are nothing but a commercial, uh, um, you know, commercial event. Yeah, of We course. know that. These people well, more than want to event. make money. Yeah. How, you, you know, at the end of the day, they deface the England kit. They deface even, even, listen, you know, we're talking about football. Traditional colours of a football team have even been changed. Why? Because the, but, I mean, the, that, the manufacturer want to make that money. That could be the Chilean flag. You what, sorry? That could be the Chilean flag. We have no idea. I mean, um, well, fundamentally, you know more about Team, than GB, I do, team so. GB uniforms has to have the British flag as we know it yes. somewhere. It, exactly. And then you can do all the design around it. I understand artistic license. You want to keep it fresh and funky and you want to keep yeah. people interested. Cool. But at least a third of the image has to have the Union Jack Absolutely. as we know I, it. And I have to say, just in defense of, of things like the Olympics, they're not just about the commercial stuff at all. It's Aren't not about they? sports. Which, no, they? absolutely you've not. Got, you've got a fast food restaurant, one of the Golden Arches, sponsoring it. And Why are you having someone <laughs> that's making people obese sponsoring no, health? There are, Come on. there are commercial aspects to it. But it's all about wonderfulness, about getting people together, uniting about sport. This is is how it all started. So I'll take issue on with that one and, and, <laughs> well, and a number of other things. It's a sporting <laughs> event that's supposed to promote sport, yes. unity, good health. Yes. He's talking about oh, a fast food event. You've also on. got another another company, a, a beer. A fizzy drink company that's not Pepsi, yeah. I believe. Uh, um, <laughs> Correct. Uh, advertising. I mean, with respect, it's a commercial exercise. I love the Olympics, don't get me wrong. It's commercial. Let's move on. I want to get this story in. Defiant JK. Yes. She's in the sun. JK goes to war against trans. Zealots. And, and on the front of the metro, she says, come and arrest me. Yes, yes J.K. Rowling. J.K. Rowling as in bowling. Um, <laughs> just, so, just so we know. So, J.K., I feel so sorry for her, J.K. And, and the things that's happened. She's been banned from even attending events where her intellectual property are being used, the whole Harry Potter thing, and so on and so forth. That is appalling. The issue here is about, which another law which has come in today, is about the Scottish hate law, effectively, yeah. and turning round. And for, again, it's about definition. Because you can turn around and whilst there are freedom of speech, there aren't freedom from consequences. Uh -huh. And if something is genuinely going to be hateful, then you should absolutely stamp that out. What we don't know yet, however, is the definition. It's woolly language. So just saying, if she uh, maintains her view that mm -hmm. a woman is a woman and you can't have, uh, you can't be a man in a, in a dress and become a woman. Basic biology. I mean, that, that's what she says. Yeah. Is, is she entitled to that view? And yes. That, and, and no, well, no, this is the point. So if the new law says that she's going to get prosecuted and it's going to be a criminal offence, then that's an issue because we must have freedom of speech and anything that curtails that freedom of speech needs to be really, really carefully looked at. And that's happening around the world. There's similar things in Canada. They Ebon, have the online harm. Ebon, I completely hear you. I understand exactly what you're saying. But ultimately, I can say that uh, a double rapist is not a woman and that could potentially end up me being in prison. But I could talk about this all night and we will... 
after the credits have rolled. Thank you to the panel. Thank you so much. That is all from me tonight. You've been watching The Independent Republic of JJ and Isiobi. A huge thank you to my war cabinet. And I'll be back tomorrow at 8pm, only here on Talk TV. Good night. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr.